How does Jordan Peterson speak so eloquently and effectively? If you've listened to any number of his lectures and interviews, it doesn't take long to recognize that Jordan has a remarkable verbal intelligence and athleticism with language. Agree or disagree with him, there's no denying that his selection of words is incredibly effective. The fact that his teachings are prone to stimulating behaviors and beliefs residing deep in the subconscious of his listeners is further confirmation that Jordan truly is a word wizard. The more I watch Jordan, the more I realize that there are so many admirable qualities to his command of language. And today I want to analyze several genius techniques he employs in his speaking that help him speak persuasively and powerfully. As a preface, it should be noted that the ideas the internet has recently come to access through Jordan Peterson are the products of decades of research and contemplation on his part. Before he entered the public spotlight, Jerry Springfield, I mean Jordan Peterson, was studying, modifying, and reworking his perspective on the subjects that he would teach to his university students and eventually to his online audiences. The occasional recording of his lectures or public presentations allows us to see just how long he has been improving his understanding and delivery of the topics that he is championed for by audiences today. For example, many of Jordan's attitudes on science, pain, and depression discussed on the Lex Friedman podcast are the same observations he made 10 years ago in his University of Toronto TED Talk. His speech to the Independent Institute was a retelling of the same mythological narratives he discussed over a 13-part TiVo television broadcast series in 2004. The anecdotes and observations in his recent Hillsdale commencement address were the material of full-fledged university lectures that he taught decades ago, not to mention the dozens of academic papers, books, and programs Jordan has authored over the years, nor the 20,000 hours he spent as a clinical psychologist, a discipline that demands making ideas understandable and actionable to your patient. The Jordan Peterson we know today, the poster child intellectual, is preceded by half a lifetime of experience and education, and it's expected that he would have his words down to a science. This is important to understand because it's easy to hastily assume that Jordan is assembling all of his thoughts and ideas in real time. Of course, he is skilled on his feet at providing wit and wisdom spontaneously, but the profoundness of his statements is embedded in an equally profound study of relationships, theology, mythology, psychology, and many other different bodies of knowledge that have underscored most of his career. So we get that he possesses a deep well of knowledge, but how does Jordan Peterson compose his speech so well? What about the more relevant topics he hasn't studied for years? How does he still manage to speak eloquently and effectively on those? Well, many have concluded that it's due to Jordan's possession of an expansive vocabulary and his employment of creative language, as if memorizing a list of sophisticated and intellectual words was the secret to his success. And Yes, while every word of his can be found in a dictionary, it's not the individual words themselves that make up the distinct speaking style of Jordan Peterson. Randomly injecting Jordan Peterson expressions like hierarchy, fundamental presupposition, or postmodern neo-Marxist into your speech isn't going to make you sound like Jordan any more than a metal guitarist can make a symphony orchestra sound more classical. In order to produce an elegant and euphonious melody, you have to know how to arrange and conduct the orchestra. And Jordan Peterson is precisely that, a language conductor. Let me explain what I mean. Every orchestra requires a score, sheet music, that can indicate the pitches, rhythms, chords, lyrics, and responsibilities of the musicians. An orchestra lacking musical notation lacks a framework for harnessing the unique properties of each instrument. A glorious, resounding melody is achieved only when the instruments are in tune and time with the written score. In the melody of communication, Jordan also adheres to a distinct framework, a score, if you will, that allows him to frequently achieve depth and delight with his speaking. What is this framework? 
He conducts his presentations as investigations. Investigations that have distinct setups and stages. For example, the first stage is to begin by asking a genuine question, typically an ambitious or difficult question that engages higher level thinking, one of increasing importance to his audience and of which the answer to will yield a tremendous amount of insight. His questions include, what is reality? What does it mean to bear your cross? Or what is morality? What does it mean to be responsible? Framing the discussion with a question very clearly defines the tone and objective of the investigation, both for himself and his audience. For his audience, it concentrates their attention on a singular pursuit, the answer to the question. For himself, it serves as a prompt to keep him focused on answering the question. It's not uncommon for Jordan to frequently restate the question a few minutes into the discussion in an attempt to recalibrate the audience's focus on the target objective. This is a technique called circling. Jordan will answer a question, proceed to provide an answer that may include several detours and anecdotes, and then he'll restate the question, often rephrasing it so as to gauge whether or not it's been sufficiently answered. The answer to the question, particularly if it's been a comprehensive one, can easily provide grounds for developing the discussion and move the investigation forward. It's also worth noting that adopting the framework of an investigation allows Jordan to emulate a dialogue with his audience. In an academic atmosphere, he might solicit students for their opinions. In a more public environment, asking a question allows him to adopt the audience's perspective allowing him to dismantle any misconceptions or instinctive assumptions they may have. He often plays ignorant with his questions, probes opposing arguments, and pursues counterpoints of thought in order to demonstrate their absurdity. He can, of course, in his attempt to uncover any underlying assumptions, take this scrutiny too far and has been criticized for getting lost in a definition spiral. If the topic was walking a dog, Jordan might start with questions similar to, what does it mean to walk a dog? What does mean mean? What does dog mean? Regardless, his ability to update the discussion with questions from different perspectives shows that he never assumes the audience is following him at each turn. This approach resembles how a consultation might unfold between a psychologist and a client where a shared understanding needs to be achieved in order to advance further in the melody of discussion. To achieve understanding, you have to ask the right questions. For music to sound melodious, the musicians need to know how to interpret the notes through what is often called a key signature, a set of sharps and flats placed at the beginning of a section of music to indicate ascending or descending pitches. The slightest variation in the key signature can change the tenor and tone of the music. In a conversation or a presentation, there also tends to be a predetermined undertone that influences how you pitch your sentences. Because it's easy to speak aimlessly just as a musician might play notes at random. You might hear a few notes that sound good together, but wouldn't it be better if there was harmony and congruency between every note, between every sentence? This is precisely what Jordan is able to achieve by playing his words and ideas with a specific interpretive framework in mind. Call it his key signature. What is this interpretive framework? If you watch any number of Jordan's lectures, you'll begin to notice common themes, tropes, narratives that emerge and express Jordan's perspective on the world, on ourselves. Jordan has a habitual way of thinking and perceiving the world, just as we all do. You might disagree with his interpretation of morality, theology, psychology, politics, but his outlook on each of those bodies of knowledge fundamentally guides his thinking and speaking. This may seem a rather trivial point to make, of course everyone varies in their thinking, but it's important to understand because knowing how you want to interpret something provides a lens through which you speak, through which you select your words and orient your thoughts. For example, if I want to convince you that Jordan Peterson is a feline, as ridiculous as that may be, I will compose my sentences in a way that support that conclusion. I might make reference to his enthusiastic usage of his hands and refer to them as his paws. 
His gray hair might be a subject of discussion, his cat-like movements, and strange avoidance of water. Pretty soon, you begin to interpret his movements through that feline lens and are more attentive to observing those tendencies in Jordan, even if they don't exist. Of course, I'm not suggesting that every point Jordan makes is a predetermined conclusion that he imposes on his audience. The beauty and appeal of his speaking is, in fact, due in no small part to the spontaneous, inquisitive, meandering nature of his discussions and his ability to create coherency out of the disconnected pathways of his speaking. This is because Jordan speaks through a macro interpretive framework that holds many smaller interpretive frameworks within it. For example, his main interpretive framework can be aptly summarized by a quote from his book, 12 Rules for Life. Jordan says, be responsible and get your life in order and you will begin to instantiate meaning in life and guard against the forces of confusion and chaos. Inside of that belief, which broadly embodies the call to action found in most of his talks, you find many smaller interpretive frameworks that allow him to bring unity and coherency to smaller sections of his speeches. For example, in his commencement address for the Hillsdale College, Jordan introduces the biblical story of Noah's Ark at one of the many culminating points in the speech. If you carefully parse his sentences leading up to that story, you'll find him referencing words like flood, sin, and catastrophe. In other words, he's laying the groundwork for the introduction of the story of Noah, which you might call his punchline. He knows in advance the story he wants to cite in his speech, and he extracts themes, motifs, and key vocabulary from that story to embody in his sentences leading up to the grand reveal. The punchline provides a micro-interpretive framework for his discussion, which takes place within the macro-interpretive framework of remediating and embracing suffering, which is the focus of his commencement address, and an idea in line with the chief idea that we read from his book. And I kind of have a framework of interpretation and then I have some potential narrative places I can go. And then I think, okay, I can go juggle that and see what happens. And so then what I wanna do is concentrate on that process while attending to the audience to make sure that the words are landing and then see if I can delve into it deeply enough so that a narrative emerges spontaneously with an ending. It's a very masterful speaking technique and one often used by comedians to create punchlines. They know the ending, the culminating point of humor, and instead of galloping to the punchline immediately, they work backwards, subtly seeding their sentences with ideas that can be brought to fruition in a future peak moment of realization where everything comes together. Got all these balls in the air, and they're going somewhere, and this is how they come together. And people love that, right? To say, mm -hmm. oh, this and this and this and this and this, whack together. Jordan is able to do this often by virtue of his large stock of mythological and theological narratives that he often uses as micro interpretive frameworks for his discussions. He knows what he wants to be the target conclusion and uses that lens through which you might make a profound point. He's not just talking as you and I might. There's a framework behind his words and that makes all the difference in speaking powerfully. I wanna provide a few insights into Jordan's vocabulary and his word selection process. Because as much as Jordan is known for his agility and precision with rhetoric, there are a few patterns to his words that contribute to his habit of seemingly sourcing the right words. One of his verbal behaviors is his employment of words that carry imagery or reference visual concepts. For example, in the following clips, Listen for the words that have a vivid, visible meaning associated with them. Your initial representation of it, it's like, it's really low resolution. It's like one bit. Where people whose belief systems were shattered, at least in part, by the competition between religious and scientific viewpoints, and that have learned to shield out the things that shine forth. And when you have a child, you can look through the child's eyes again. And Since the 1990s, interest in his practical intelligence has declined precipitously because they never conceptualize death and suffering. They're naive, right? 
It, it never enters their, the theater of their imagination, and it's because they're protected from it. Words like low resolution, shattered, precipitously, and theater conjure up images in the listener's mind. That image is able to be affiliated with the concept or context in Jordan's speech to grant it more clarity and more realism. The words he chooses may not be the best words in the grand scope of language, but they're certainly more effective than if he employed words like unrepressed, separated, or inferior, which, although we recognize in meaning, are not affiliated with any imagery or a single tangible idea. They don't provide sturdy scaffolding in the listener's mind upon which Jordan can build with his ideas. He also relies on another unique habit in his practice of efficient word retrieval, and that is his gesticulation. Jordan's speaking style is largely distinguished by his creative and dynamic use of his hands. In fact, his body language has become such a signature attribute of his speaking that his gestures have even been given titles and personalities of their own, such as the Hydra, the Rope. Mr. Twister, Crab Claw, and the Pattern Overlay. As much as they may complement his spoken words, he also relies on his gestures to help verbalize what is currently unspoken. Whenever he's at a loss for the right word, Jordan will excessively engage his hands in attempt to mime the feeling he wishes to translate into language, almost as if he were summoning the word from its realm of concealment into existence. The, the, the barriers are lifted temporarily, and, and it's something that you can, you can, what would you say? It's not manipulate precisely, you can exploit. And so that means that there are some meanings that we regard as inviolably real. And as much as I admire his capacity to source precise language, I also find his silence, his moments of deliberate hesitation, just as strategic. Jordan often pauses, ponders, and is able to produce the right words because he affords himself the necessary time to think. To do something like sit on the edge of my bed or on the edge of a chair and to think, there's probably something that I'm doing wrong or not doing well enough. Even if he's mid-sentence, he isn't pressured to rapidly complete the sentence if it means sacrificing clarity. On the subject of taking time to think and present ideas, I would be negligent if I didn't address one of Jordan's greatest challenges, that is, condensing his ideas into short time frames. The subject material that Jordan often speaks of has no doubt been used to being delivered in two-hour university lectures or a lengthy dialogue or interview. When he's been required to condense his ideas into mere minutes, it's clear that he struggles with truncating his answers and observations into simple and easily understandable sentences. One such example was his participation in the 2018 Monk debate on political correctness, where Jordan's six-minute opening statement was unusually populated by scholarly words and ideas. His thoughts were rather disjointed and hurried and were uncharacteristic of his typical graceful way of stepping through ideas. A limitation on time seems to put a limitation on Jordan's ability to provide a foundation for his ideas, and that seems to compromise his clarity of thought. It's evident he thrives more in an environment where he has freedom over the duration of his thoughts. In fact, in his discussion with Piers Morgan, Jordan states that it was for this reason that he stopped largely doing TV interviews. The limited time constraints coupled with the agenda-driven aggressive temperament of the hosts weren't optimal conditions for the maximal receptiveness of his ideas. One final observation I have of Jordan is on his public image. In his pursuit to remediate the world with his words and wisdom, it's important that we don't dismiss the importance that his public image plays in the receptiveness of his ideas. Anyone discovering Jordan Peterson for the first time is likely to encounter a gentlemanly archetype 
tall, fit, fashionably dressed, sporting a custom-tailored three-piece suit, slicked hair, a well-kept beard. In other words, he plays the part of a distinguished public intellectual. Contrast this with pre-2019 Jordan Peterson, who was dealing with a myriad of medical ordeals and in his own words was, quote, overweight and inattentive to my health. After he underwent treatment and was able to achieve some stability with his health and life, it's obvious he took steps to reinvent his image and most recently has made efforts to incorporate trendy fashion items into his wardrobe, including his now signature maroon and navy heaven and hell suit, an Elon Musk tie, and, well, other, shall we say, memeable fashion choices. Contrast all of this with someone who has little concern for their public image, and you find a staggeringly different level of responsiveness from the public. Consider Slovenian philosopher and public intellectual Slavoj Žižek, a man contending with many of the same ideas as Peterson. Žižek is largely regarded a brilliant mind in the academic community, but very often disregarded by the public due to his thick accent, poor diction with words, and unbecoming twitches and tics as a result of his neurological condition. He could be preaching the most important points in human history, but you'd be hard-pressed to find someone willing to spend hours decrypting his words and ignoring the slurred speech and sniffles. Or consider Stephen Hawking, a man who could perhaps run circles around Jordan intellectually, but wouldn't stand a chance against Jordan in a public speaking forum. Jordan simply has the demeanor and class that you might expect someone of his caliber of intellect to have, and developing that image has done nothing but bolster his popularity. Because words and ideas aren't just some disembodied intellectual value you cite, as much as their merit should perhaps be considered on their own unattached to the superficial physical attributes of the speaker, there's no denying that words do gain or lose weight by the very person that presents them. Of course, I say all of this with the utmost respect for Jordan as an intellectual and individual. What makes him powerful as a speaker has little to do with his fashion preferences and everything to do with providing hungry minds with the knowledge that seems to sufficiently address their deepest curiosities and darkest challenges. Every time he speaks, he is conducting an orchestra of words and employing speaking instruments that allow him to produce a symphony of resounding sentences. His capacity to speak melodically and eloquently stems from, yes, a lifetime of teaching, writing, and thinking about the very ideas that are freshly introduced to his listeners, but more than that, he couples his rich knowledge and verbal prowess with a deep curiosity and passion that is palpable to his admirers. Perhaps that is what makes him most irresistible, his unabashed, heartfelt, intense pursuit of meaning that underwrites his content and character.